Who says 30 can't be fun? The Columbus Square Bowling Palace is turning 30, and the fun has just begun. Come celebrate our birthday with us. With 64 lanes of bowling open 24 hours for fun with friends and family, no matter what time it is, there's always time at the Palace. The Palace is the perfect place to hold your birthday party or corporate employee groups. Call us today to make your reservation. 30 years old and better than new, with millions of dollars in renovations at the highest rated bowling center in Columbus, the Columbus Square Bowling Palace. for Mark Myers. He fades back, looks here in the near side of the field, looking into the end zone. He has his target here in the near corner of the end zone. That's how they'll hook up for the second time. That touchdown pass there from Mark Myers basically sums up the entire game Saturday. Hello and thanks for watching Cardinal Kickoff, your exclusive source for all things Otterbein football, brought to you by the Columbus Square Bowling Palace. I'm David Kinder, joined in the studio, the man to my left, John Bazika. John, how you doing? David, I'm doing good. I, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about Otterbein football this coming weekend. I'm looking forward to seeing what they'll do against Baldwin Wallace. Well, last Saturday, John, Otterbein left the friendly confines of Westerville and they headed north to Don Shula Stadium. And unfortunately, the outcome was not what we expected to be. They fall 28 to nothing to the Blue Streaks. And for Otterbein, it was a game that was characterized by the quarterback, Mark Myers of John Carroll. And he had an unbelievable day, John. Yeah, David, I feel like a broken record when I talk about it. But uh, this guy's arm strength, Mark Myers, he was a, he's an NFL prospect. Uh, he's a pit transfer to John Carroll, and he's just an all-around great quarterback. We talked to John Costco uh, this week on WOBN from WJCU, and he told us that this guy's going to sling it around there. He's going to th hit all of his receivers. He's going to hit Greenwood. He's going to hit Howe. He's going to hit everybody who he has in his arsenal. And there was one play that stood out to me. I know we talked about it during the game, but there was a play where David was calling, and uh, Myers dropped back, and he was in his own end zone, and he threw the ball all the way across the field, and David said, well, they get it back to their own line of scrimmage. But in reality... He actually ended up just getting it past the first down marker to the 25-yard line. So in actuality, he threw that ball about 45 yards. And it was just truly amazing because all he did was drop back and made it look effortless. He was truly something to marvel at. You know, from a statistics standpoint, it was actually his worst game of the season. Threw for 226 yards, two touchdowns. That was the least amount of yards he's thrown for the entire season, John. Well, That's now true. we're going to take a look at some of the highlights from the game brought to you by the John Carroll Athletic Department. We pick up action in the second quarter. JCU already up 7-0. Daquan Grobesmith takes it from three yards out to increase their lead to 14-0. Here it is. Grobesmith again. He takes the pitch from Mark Myers, and he runs untouched 37 yards into the end zone, his second of the game, extending the JCU lead to 21-0 before halftime. Here, Otterbein trying to get back in at Sizemore, finds Connor Lucas for the first down. Lucas, the game's high receiver for the Cards. However, he can't avoid the front seven of JCU this time. Otterbein's quarterback sacks seven times in this game. This play here put it away eight yards out. Mark Myers finds Marshall Howell their second receiving touchdown of the game. And for Otterbein, the stats weren't pretty. 39 rushing attempts and just 46 yards. Four of seven on third down conversions. A pair of missed field goals. Mark Myers, despite this being his worst game of the season, still threw for 226 yards and a pair of touchdowns. John, for the Cardinals, the offensive woes continued in this one. We saw in the first drive of the game, Coach Dow brought out that eye formation, something we haven't seen all year long. Drew Irvin was the deep man, originally a fullback, and he carried effectively. They got it all the way to the 18-yard line, as we saw in the video. Nick Gannis missed the field goal, and it apparently turned him off from the eye formation a little bit, and they switched it up to the shotgun, which proved to be ineffective throughout the most of the game. John, why do you think they switched from the eye to the shotgun? Which formation going forward do you think is the best for these Cardinals? Well, I, I think that early in the game, it was Coach Dow's idea to come out and run that I formation. Beat the ball down John Carroll's throat the whole first quarter and see what happens. And for that first drive, that's exactly what he did. But then they missed the field goal. They panicked. They went away from Irvin being the deep back. They tried to bring in Tyler Hammond. They tried to bring in Derek Rudolph. And opposed to running that power back idea, they switched it up the whole game. And it's really been a problem each game where they've used five different backs at times. And it's been a problem because you look at this team and they need to stay consistent. The one thing about last year is that they were pretty consistent on who took the carries. They had Robertson, they had Berzanko, and they even had Rudolph mixed in there a little bit. But you knew that Robertson and Berzanko were the main guys. I guess the main thing I would say is they need to find a main guy and they need to find that one way to run the ball. And I think the I formation is the best way to do it. Uh, if you were the coach, who would you pick right now to be that premier back out of the five? Who do you think should get the majority of the handoffs going forward through the rest of the season? Well, I, I think that Derek Rudolph is a good back. 
I really do. I think he's a very shifty back. I know he came from uh, the Columbus area. He went to high school down here. I think he went to Eastmore. Eastmore. He's a very good back. He's a quick back. But the combination that I like most is I like Tyler Hammond and I like um, Drew Irvin the most because I feel like they both bring the biggest um, difference in the mix of how they run. Irvin is, is this power back. He's Bronco Nagurski style, as we were talking about, and he's just a great back. And then you look at it and you look on the other side, and you have Tyler Hammond. They call him speedy, and by nature, that's exactly what he is. I just love their running styles mixed with each other. And you can even mix in Rudolph every once in a while, but um, going with that mix, I think, would be the best. Well, Coach Dowd mentioned to us that he would not hesitate to pull a quarterback if he had to, and that's exactly what he did at halftime. He took out Ben Sizemore in favor of the junior Brick Davis. Sizemore had uh, 94 yards in the first half, Davis 84 yards. Saturday, who do you see getting the start at signal caller? Who do you think deserves it, and ultimately, who will be the one throwing the passes for Otter Divine against Baldwin Wallace? Well, Ben Sizemore is a senior, so that means means that by uh, de facto, he should be taking the snaps. But it's the same thing that Dalp has said all year. He can go to either quarterback when he wants to. Davis is ready whenever he wants him. And as of right now, until Brick Davis is officially named the starter going into this week, Ben Sizemore, in my mind, should take the snaps. Well, we got a chance to sit down with Coach Dalp and uh, talk to him about Saturday's game and looking forward to Bolden Wallace. And here's what he had to say. Back here with Coach Dalp. Coach, uh, last week in the uh, loss to John Kale, you guys came out in an offense we hadn't seen uh, much this year to start the drive. Uh, the first two games of the year came out in the shotgun. Mm -hmm. And the first drive this week, you came out in that uh, offset eye formation. Yeah. Irvin was the deep back. Uh, and then uh, the first drive missed the field goal, and then you went back to the shotgun. Can you just talk about why you went away from that after you had a little bit of success on the first drive and why you went to the shotgun instead? Well, you know, after the during the first drive, we thought, you know, putting Drew back at tailback gave us a you know a chance to go downhill a little bit um, we were successful with that but then they made their adjustments and when, when we offset our back they knew which way we were going so in the second half if you see or later in the drives we put them in the eye back and we got back to that a little bit and it was a little bit more successful um, so we just thought you know going out of eye and underneath a little bit gave you know drew a chance to get downhill and you know we just base block some stuff and try and try to get some yards that way you know, as far as going back to the shotgun, you know, we need to sling the ball a little bit. When they, when they start stopping your run, you got to, you know, throw the ball a little bit. So that, you know, that was the main, the main reason that we went back to shotgun and read and throwing. Uh, you mentioned to us last week that you wouldn't hesitate to pull Ben Sizemore if you felt like you should. Uh, last week at halftime, you made the switch to Brick Davis. Can you just tell us why you made that switch and who should we expect to see Saturday at quarterback? Well, I think, you know, we, I thought just at that point we needed a spark. I think, you know, when you change something up, and, and we did, you know, and Brick came in, first throw, you know, completes it, and we're, we're on the move, and, you know, we just ended up stalling. Um, but I think sometimes you just need a little bit of a, a different look and, and somebody in there to run, you know, to run the offense. Um, and it's nothing, you know, against either one of them. I just thought at that point we need a little bit of a spark, and that's what we went with. Um, you know, right now, you know, uh, I, I, would, I would see Ben, um, you know, starting the game, but if, if something goes a little bit different again, then, you know, we'll, we'll make an adjustment. Defensively speaking, uh, the front sevens had a little bit of trouble getting pressure on the quarterback. Just two sacks coming into the week four. Uh, couldn't get to Mark Myers at all in the game. Uh, what have you guys been practicing? What have you been teaching them, telling them? Have you been trying to get more blitzes in to try to get more pressure on the quarterback? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think defensively we need to open it up a little bit more. Uh, I think, you know, schematically, I think we're okay. We're just, you know, we're just not getting there. And, and I think they've been working that all week. You know, I mean, the Baldwin Wallace's quarterback is very elusive. So he's different. He's not going to sit back there like Myers did. Slack will take off and run on you. So, um, you know, with that being said, you got to be careful how much you pressure him because if you pressure him a lot and you miss, you know, he's going to be off and running. Well, thank you very much, Coach. We appreciate it a lot. Good luck this Saturday against Baldwin Wallace. Hopefully we'll see a victory. Oh, well, me too. Thanks. We thank Coach Dow for uh, letting us sit down with him. We're going to take a quick break now. When we come back, we'll discuss the Baldwin Wallace offense and defense. Still up? Can't sleep? Looking for something to do? Come to a place where the fun never sleeps. Columbus Square Bowling Palace. It's been the premier bowling destination in Central Ohio for 30 years. With 64 lanes of bowling open 24 hours, no matter what time it is, there's always time at the Palace for fun with friends and family. Join the Night Owl regulars at Columbus Square Bowling Palace, where the fun never sleeps. Well, John, things don't get any easier this week as the Yellow Jackets of Bolden Wallace will come down to Memorial Stadium, play under the lights coming into this one. Bolden Wallace 2-1 on the year, 1-1 in the conference. I guess the only thing 
to look forward to for Otterbein is their one loss this year is also to John Carroll by a similar score, 27 to 7. And John, this Otterbein team defeated Bolden Walls kind of in an upset they last did. year. They were favored to win that game. Otterbein won 38 to 17. You might remember that's the game that Joey Robertson had that 82 yard screen pass from Aaron Kincaid. However, John, going into that game last year was a very different feeling around campus. Otterbein was undefeated, 3 to 0. And as you said earlier, they were expected not to win that game, but for different reasons. Yeah, going into that game last year, they were expected not to win. And now this year, it's kind of the same situation, but as David said, different circumstances. Last year was how long can they keep this going? This year it's how long can they stay alive? And I guess this is just a really survival test game. They're coming down here. It's going to be under the lights. It's our game. It's our game to win this time. And last year it was Baldwin Wallace's game to win. But, you know, different circumstances. As, as I said earlier, you don't know until Saturday. You can only tell when the game actually happens on Saturday. We can talk about it now. All we want about the expectation and what's going to happen. But all that's going to matter is what plays out on Saturday, David. Yeah, as we take a look down this roster for Baldwin Wallace, you see there's not a lot of standout guys. We might see a different quarterback. Kyle Doransky replaced Michael Slacks at quarterback last week, so we're not sure who we'll see at the quarterback position. What do you expect to see out of Bolden Walls coming into Memorial well, Stadium? Well, Kyle Ordzanski is a guy that I saw a lot in high school. He was a uh, Canton McKinley quarterback, and he quarterbacked them pretty much all four years. He played a little bit as a freshman, then he played all the way to his senior year. And he was a very interesting quarterback to watch in high school as he would sling the ball around to all of his different guys, and he had a good running back always. But the one thing that was always a constant with him, no matter how good the team was around him, is that he always would make mistakes. He is a huge mistake-prone quarterback, and don't be surprised if he goes out and he throws three touchdowns, but then he has three interceptions to back it up. That's just the type of quarterback that he is. I'm not sure a lot about Michael Slack, but if it was my decision, I'm guessing that you'll see a lot of Kyle Ordzanski, and he's a very mistake-prone quarterback. It should be interesting to see how he does against this Otterbein secondary. Yeah, that's good. Otterbein's defense hasn't forced many turnovers, only three coming into the fourth week of the season. What else does the Otterbein offense need to do to get it done on Saturday, John? Well, Otterbein is dead last in the OAC in rushing. They average 63.8 yards per game. They need, to, they need to clean that up. That's just step one. You need to run the ball better. However that is, whether it's out of the power eye, whether it's out of shotgun, whether it's out of the option, you need to run the football. You can't beat a team unless you can run the football somewhat. I have not seen a team ever win without at least having run the football a little bit. It's going to be very hard for them to win games if they go on like this. Well, it's interesting. Their one win this year, over 100 yards rushing. Yeah, Their no, two losses, is. under 50 yards rushing. So obviously the rushing game needs to pick it up if Otterbein wants to win this one. Well, we like to end the show with a segment every week where we take a look back at a notable moment in Otterbein football history we call Football Flashback. In the old days of college football, professionalism was a big deal. Players were often paid under the table for their services and often went under aliases and played for different schools. In 1896, the Western Conference, now known as the Big Ten, was the first to attempt to solve the problem. Six years later, the Ohio Athletic Conference was formed. On October 10, 1902, the OAC officially became an athletic organization with Case Tech, Kenyon, Oberlin, Ohio Wesleyan, Western Reserve, and The Ohio State University as founding members. Almost every Ohio college football team has been a member of the OAC at some point in its 112 year history. The conference continued to grow. By 1927, enrollment had swelled to 27 schools. Otterbein joined the league in 1921 and has been a member ever since. Today the OAC is comprised of 10 Ohio universities. In the past 20 years, the OAC has claimed 11 Division III football national titles, making it one of the country's premier athletic conferences. Well, before we sign off here, John, let's get your score prediction for Saturday and some final thoughts on the game. Well, this is the hardest part of the show, David. I talked about it with you before we started shooting it, and uh, it's really hard this week because this is an Otterbein team that you want to say is going in the right direction in spots, but last weekend against John Carroll, they took a bunch of steps back. There were some offensive issues. There were some defensive issues. And um, ultimately, this weekend, Baldwin Wallace, it's not going to get any easier. It never does. It's the OAC. It's possibly the toughest football conference in all of Division III football. And it's going to be hard for me to say this, but Baldwin Wallace is going to come down here, and they're going to beat Otterbein. It's going to be close the whole game, but in the fourth quarter, Baldwin Wallace will pull away a little bit at the end. Baldwin Wallace, final score, Baldwin Wallace, 28, Otterbein, 14. I think this is the first time either of us has picked against the Cardinals this year, and I'm going to have to go against them as well. They just haven't shown to me this year that they can get it done in the close games, John. You know, I, I don't feel like Sizemore is going to be able to up to the task. Uh, I don't know who they're going to run out at quarterback, but I'm going to give 
Final score, 23-21. It comes down to the wire, just like you said in the fourth quarter, and you know it's a mistake that, that ends the game, I, I feel. It's going to be something yeah. silly that ends the game, and Otterbein's not going to get the victory this week. That's just my prediction. Hopefully, though, hey, hopefully, hopefully it's both a wrong. completely yeah. different game, yeah. and I'll be the first person to admit. Well, we'd like to thank you for watching Cardinal Kickoff, brought to you by the Columbus Square Bowling Palace. Remember, if you can't make it to Memorial Stadium on Saturday, you can watch it streaming live on Otterbein.tv. I will have the call along with freshman Elijah Gonzalez. We thank you for watching. For everyone in the studio, my co-producer Aaron Reinhart, I am David Kinder with John Bazika. Thanks for watching Cardinal Kickoff. Keep it locked. says 30 can't be fun. The Columbus Square Bowling Palace is turning 30 and the fun has just begun. Come celebrate our birthday with us. With 64 lanes of bowling open 24 hours for fun with friends and family, no matter what time it is, there's always time at the Palace. The Palace is the perfect place to hold your birthday party or corporate employee groups. Call us today to make your reservation. 30 years old and better than new, with millions of dollars in renovations at the highest rated bowling center in Columbus. The Columbus Square Bowling Palace.